It's a pleasure to be with you this morning for what I'm sure will be a very um, thoughtful discussion with my panelists. I'm very happy to be with you. Uh, I must say this is my first hybrid event. I did a lot of in-person event before the pandemic, and now um, I also did a lot from my home office. So I'm very pleased to be with you virtually and in person as well. I must say today's uh, theme for our discussion is very um, interesting, and I'm sure it will gather a lot of insight and thoughts. Um, the path towards an inclusive and sustainable recovery is very important. I know uh, at EDC, I'm the person responsible for our inclusive trade strategy, uh, so I'm very invested in this topic. And like many organizations, I am sure uh, we talk a lot about our, um, the, our insight in terms of the economic recovery, as well as sustainability, as well as inclusivity. So I'm sure I'm not the only one where this discussion is happening at a more frequent uh, uh, basis than it used to be. Uh, today, the, the reason I'm very pleased to be here is because we're also uh, going to hear um, the thoughts of a number of panelists. These are wonderful individuals with a lot of insights. So let me start by introducing them. So uh, Cassandra Dorrington, President and CEO of Canadian Aboriginal and Minority Supplier Council. Sylvia Punchak. President of the Women Business Enterprises Canada Council, Vicky Sounders, CEO of SheEO, as well as Nadia Theodore, Senior Vice President, Global Government and Industry Relation at Maple Leaf Foods. And lastly, Carolyn Wilkins, former Senior Deputy Governor of the Bank of Canada, external member of the Bank of England's Financial Policy Committee. Ladies, welcome. I'm certainly looking forward to our chat. So uh, I'm thinking that the best way to start is probably to level set. And I will ask a few of you to help us understand where, what's our starting point? What's the point we're starting from? So by level set, I mean, what have been the social and economic impacts of the pandemic on small businesses, women, and supplier diversity? I'm wondering, Vicky, if you can get us started. Thank you. I'm uh, very happy to be here. Um, so uh, I'm gonna st I was on a panel recently and they're like, did it get worse or better for women during COVID? And my answer is yes. Uh, it's, you know, the binary uh, is no longer serving us. We, it was an incredibly challenging year and a bit. It has been, it continues to be for uh, women in small and medium sized businesses. We have been uh, under resourced prior to COVID um, and uh, under supported in general in the marketplace from a finance perspective, but also from just the ecosystems and, and how we were performing previously. And so COVID just exacerbated a lot of those challenges. Being less resourced really hurt us when we went into COVID more so. Uh, from a financing perspective, investors really doubled down on existing portfolios. Any kind of gains that we made previous to uh, this uh, just for those who don't know, about 2% uh, of capital goes to 51% of the population globally. It's incredibly painful. Those numbers went down quite dramatically, 80% reduction uh, during COVID. And so uh, there was less capital available for those that were already uh, kind of starved of capital. On top of that, the care burden uh, was incredibly challenging. So uh, a lot of folks that were at home that have young kids were playing teacher uh, as well as trying to, to run their businesses, really, really challenging. Uh, and a, a lot of the instruments that we put in place to support these businesses wasn't allowed to be used for any kind of childcare or support around that. It was to hire people or to keep people on staff. So that was hard. Uh, and then on top of all of that, uh, the sort of inherent biases that were already out there got exacerbated. 
So for frontline workers, for those who um, couldn't afford childcare, that was really, really challenging. And so I think on the, on the flip side, uh, the good news part is we are now all quite aware of the systemic biases and the barriers that exist uh, for women and non-binary folks, those have been put to the margins that are in business. And, you know, five or six years ago when I started SHEEO, nobody was really talking about systemic barriers. And now we're all really schooled on this. We're really talking about root causes, the challenges in our systems. And so the sort of good news, bad news is uh, it has been really tough. Those who have been in communities together to support one another have done far better than those who have been isolated. And so again, the systemic challenges that are there uh, have created a lot of havoc. Uh, I think we're going to talk about the diversity and inclusion piece a little bit later. So I'll just pause and pass it to the next person. I'm wondering, Sylvia, if you can give us your perspective. Yeah, absolutely. And I will second uh, Vicky in uh, saying that, yes, uh, we've seen it all. Um, so first of all, we've seen businesses who and industries who had to really struggle through the pandemic. They had to shut down the doors and they really uh, needed the supports that were uh, made available to them. So they were really hanging on uh, for as long as they could. Many uh, did not survive. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I really want to um, highlight that businesses who were able to pivot, reposition themselves and remain relevant uh, throughout the pandemic, uh, they actually thrived. Uh, so we've seen a lot of women-owned businesses who doubled, tripled uh, their incomes and their revenues. Uh, we've seen businesses grow and struggle, on the other hand, with a lack of uh, employees, lack of staffing, um, issues, um, issues like, um, I don't know, logistical nightmares, you know, like uh, lack, of, uh, lack of resources, lack of sourcing. Uh, materials. So many of our businesses scaled up so quickly that they weren't able to uh, to actually keep up with the growth that was happening. So uh, luckily, we've seen those businesses to come to some success stories. Um, I I also am happy to say that um, uh, uh, at VB Canada, what we do, we connect Canadian women-owned businesses to corporate and government supply chains. And we've seen some uh, corporations and governments really step up in a big way and support women-owned businesses and other diverse businesses in a meaningful way, really creating ways and supports uh, that opened the doors and supported those businesses. Anywhere from startups uh, to multi-million dollar businesses, uh, they didn't have to struggle because of supply diversity programs and initiatives being in place, but we'll be discussing that uh, down the road, as Vicky mentioned. Cassandra, what's your perspective? Well, first of all, delighted to be here. And I, so, I'm so on board with my other panelists, both Vicky and Sylvia have spoken very well. But I want us to be very aware of something that Vicky said that I want us to cling to is that when we think of the systemic barriers that have been in the system, they've been around for a long time. We tended, and not that we didn't know them, they were there. What this has done is brought them full force. And I want to be very clear, as Sylvia said, a lot of business were impacted by this. We always like to tell the success stories that, oh, we have some sort of pivoted, done that, but we had a lot more that were heavily impacted by this, heavily impacted. And so we have to be clear that exactly what Vicky and Sylvia said, all those things that have been out there for women, have been doubly out there for our indigenous and minority community. And so therefore they are starting all the progress we thought we had made, we have to backtrack and start to bring that back again. And so therefore it's very important that we recognize that the pandemic has highlighted, brought to the forefront what we need to do as a community, as we re rebuild the economy, it has to be rebuilt with all on board as we talk to this. Government has been very clear in the past year or two, they've tried to put supports out there but we know that that's going to take some time. So I'm delighted to see that the business community as well has come on board, but we need to have very active and participating group if we're going to be able to, we're going to be able to pull up those ones who have fallen off. The new ones have come to the table to be able to go into the community where we have. So when anyone asks me how the year has been, it's been an interesting year. Uh, interesting is a good word because it will cover some of the good things that have happened, but it'll also cover some of the other things that have been brought to the forefront that we have got to deal with. Yeah. So, so we'll get to some of those good things in about a minute. Maybe, Cassandra, you can get us started on the next question. 
you may have already answered it, but to make it very clear to our audience, um, what's the main barrier when we're looking at a sustainable and inclusive um, economic recovery from your standpoint? What, what is the number one? Uh, well, there's, there's a couple key things, right? I mean, one, we need to give people back uh, access to resources because not just access to equity. I mean, they've lost the staff, they lost the technology, all those things. So we have to make sure we clearly provide those supports and that uh, access to technology, monies, whatever, to be able to get their business up and running. When we talk about the service sector, they've lost all their people as well. And they've had to say, how do we actually resume that? And they've had to actually pivot. So we still need to be able to say that technology is not just an enabler, technology is a key part of business. How do we get people access to that? Resources, how do we ensure that we are providing some support or training to help build the staff? And again, the clear lines of the decision-making. How do we get these diverse businesses to the table? We've had a lot of people saying, oh my God, we're, we're concerned and we want to bring them to the table, but are the opportunities there? So we've talked a lot about capacity building. The government's been very clear on that. We actually need the opportunities that way as they open their doors and as they're looking for business, they're looking to build by actually having those, having those contracts around the table. So those are the couple of key things that jump off the page to me. And I'll turn it over to Vicky and Sylvia to add to that. Vicky, do you want to go next and add yeah. to what Cassandra had to say? Yeah, so I mean, I, the, uh, this is actually like, I think quite simple. Like, how do we get to sustainable and inclusive? We, one of the things that I keep witnessing over and over is we're so addicted to this mono narrative of winner takes all technology equals innovation that you know as we look at businesses that are getting started there's this constant like how's that going to scale how's that going to scale how's it going to scale and a lot of our scale approach creates more inequality and focuses on like existing business models around extraction which make it extremely difficult to get to the sustainability piece and we have an example uh, we have a venture called gotcare.ca that has a new model for home health care really distributed model, they pay 30% more to healthcare workers coming into people's homes and they charge 30% less to uh, the client. Uh, they have had, they've been profitable since they started really growing. This is a really critical part of the economy going forward. Venture capitalists and investors out there are like, you're leaving 30% on the table by paying people more. That's my money. I should be getting that money. And we're so focused on our massive returns for financial that we, this, so this like impact investing piece is make my money and do the social piece. And I think we, we really need to have a larger conversation around how much is enough. There is enough to go around for everyone. And the inequality that we have witnessed during COVID has, it's just off the charts. I mean, this is over. Five people have the same wealth as half the planet. We must rethink what we value. And so I think actually not just saying these words, but shifting our business models to add primacy, not to the financials necessarily, but to the sustainability, the ESG piece. So uh, I just think there's a huge opportunity here for us at this moment in time. If we're not rethinking what we're doing now, what are we waiting for? There's like concurrent strategy, like crises coming at us left, right and center. It's the moment to really rethink what kind of world we want to create. So I'm seeing a few heads nods. Uh, Carolyn, do you want to add to, to what Vicky had to say? Well, I was just thinking of the this ESG piece, and and you know, as we're doing um, learning our lessons from COVID, and the the fact that we saw fault lines in our resilience on the health side on many many supply chains, I think it's right to focus on sort of the nuts and bolts of reinforcing that. But to the points that have been made, we can't do that without at the same time uh, focusing on the S part of ESG developing that and and also um, supporting at the global level and within our own borders, stronger labor standards and um, a stronger fo focus on increased uh, and more inclusive labor force participation. Sylvia, from your standpoint. Yeah, absolutely. I, I am going to sing my song, uh, which is uh, supply chains. Uh, I think uh, we are missing out on a huge opportunity in Canada um, uh, because we are not leveraging supply diversity initiatives, we are not opening up supply chains to diverse suppliers. Um, at uh, VB Canada, as well as CAMZ and other Canadian councils, we really do struggle convincing corporations and governments to buy into uh, social procurement. 
And there are some key players who are making significant differences and significant impact through the uh, uh, supply chains, buying from diverse suppliers, increasing their targets. But there's still not enough organizations in Canada who are making that difference within diverse communities. Uh, So I personally see a huge opportunity uh, coming out of COVID uh, where corporations and governments can actually make uh, decisive actions, uh, you know, to start looking at their data, how much they are spending with women-owned businesses, with uh, with, uh, visible minority-owned businesses, with LGBTQ2 plus businesses and others. Um, what is that spent? Uh, because from uh, the data that we have, that spent is way under 5% uh, within uh, uh, corporate and government supply chains, which is um, really sad. Um, we haven't seen uh, the dial be- being moved <laughs> um, over the past uh, decade, and COVID uh, definitely uh, did not help diverse communities to get better connected to the supply chains. So I personally feel that um, um, moving, uh, we are moving too slow, uh, supporting the, uh, the communities that need it the most. Uh, we, um, I, I know we invested money, financials um, into businesses. Was it enough? Uh, I personally believe um, that we don't need to give businesses the fish. We, we need to create opportunities for them to fish themselves. Uh, so the, the best way to support the business is to actually buy from them. And um, how do our supply chains look like? Are we buying from our own businesses? Are we buying from women-owned businesses? Are we buying from uh, visible minority-owned businesses? And uh, that is uh, uh, that is the way how we can actually support economic growth in Canada post pandemic. That is the way how we can impact the communities. And um, I was uh, recently on a panel where somebody mentioned uh, supply and diversity uh, helps everybody. It helps buyers because they are bringing new innovative thinking into their um, into their organizations. It helps suppliers because it helps them uh, scale up and grow faster. But it also helps their communities uh, because now everybody's involved and people are sharing the wealth. Uh, so similar to what uh, what Vicky mentioned. When are we finally going to start sharing that wealth uh, with each other across the communities? I think that is important thing to do. Um, bias is uh, uh, out of the way. Um, it is time for Canada to step up and to really start being more inclusive through our supply chains. Yes, so that's a clear call to action, Canada to step up. Nadia, I want to give you the opportunity. You're with a large uh, Canadian company. Any thoughts on, on what uh, your colleague panelists have been talking about? Any uh, insight you want to provide? Yeah, th- th- thanks very much um, for, for the opportunity. You know, I, I really just want to underscore, underline and circle in red, um, you know, what Vicky and then what Sylvia uh, pointed out in, in, in their opening remarks. And, and, you know, because for me, the key takeaway of this pandemic um, is really this. If all we do moving forward is focus simply on getting our economies and getting people back on our feet, so to speak, as soon as possible, uh, which is the narrative that we have been, been that the, 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 the narrative that we have been kind of latched onto, uh, we will have completely entirely missed the plot. Uh, uh, you know, a return to business as we left it pre-pandemic is not going to catapult us towards an economy that, that, and this is the key point for me, an economy that will be resilient enough to withstand which, what will undoubtedly be future shocks. Um, you know, this is, this is uh, you know, the pandemic was, was one shock of more to come, frankly. Uh, And in that regard, you know, I really think that we need to think about harnessing the assets and the capabilities, uh, and and, and Cassandra and and Sylvia pointed to this too, of the entire population um, for the benefit of the entire population, right? And and I think that what COVID has, has taught us is that, you know, that a change following something as serious and consequential and as complex, frankly, as this pandemic has been, 
will will really require uh, a response that is equally as transformative um, and 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 equally as complex in in our approach. And I and I think that you know at the heart of an inclusive and sustainable economy is really the people, and that oftentimes get lost gets lost in the conversation around the economy and fiscal policy and recovery. So so we really have to get laser focused on this idea of capital, where capital goes to, um, and how easily it is um, it, it is distributed across populations. Um, you know, what is what is our education strategy? What is our strategy around infrastructure in its broadest sense? And as Vicky pointed out, you know, what is our approach to innovation in a more modern approach that that isn't really necessarily focused on scale? And I think that if we truly think about redesigning our systems um, to ensure this kind of equality of uh, quality of opportunity, I suppose you can call it, um, you know, this distributional uh, justice and 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 really a view to intergenerational equality and, and equity, we will uh, we will be on will be on the right the, the the right path. And you know, we can talk a little bit later about some of the actual levers that we will need to contemplate. Uh, to, to get to that. And, you know, my, my song and dance is always about private public partnerships. And so, you know, we, we can talk about that a little bit later and, and what those, what looking at a new approach to traditional levers might actually look like. So that's great. Uh, I'm wondering, so you've been very clear, uh, which is great as to what needs to be done. Is there anything that has happened during the pandemic that gives us a bit of an advantage, a bit of a a push in the right direction. Cassandra, from your standpoint, is, is there anything that can be a lever that we can reinforce that has started to develop? Well, the, the two things, or at least one thing that's been really good is the pandemic has brought a number of suppliers to the forefront. There have been a number of consultations, there have been a number of faces and businesses I didn't even know were out there that have coming out there. So therefore, we've seen this whole thrust of them come forward. Now it's how do we help them build their build the atmosphere around that supports them as a business. So as the government has put some money down and we see some corporates coming to the table, it's important to be able to, how do we develop and build them so that they are successful as they move forward? The second thing that's been really, um, that's really come to the forefront is the pandemic has eliminated these geographic barriers. So now we have businesses that are now being able to not just work and be in between provinces, they can work between countries, and therefore, if they're ready and able to do that, we have now seen partnerships forming across country lines that are enabling people to do business. That would never have happened before because it was a cost prohibitive. I've got to travel. I've got to meet. I've got to talk to people that they're now able to do. So as I said, I'm seeing more business come to the forefront. Now it's a game. How do we do some asset mapping? Who do we match with who so that they can now start to build these consortiums that are more successful? And then how do we help them? go across the globe and be able to sort of identify where the supply chains fit for what they're trying to do. So those are the positive things that come to the forefront for me. So that's great. What about you, Vicky? Your, your call to action was very clear. Is there anything we're on the, the right track we need to not lose sight of? Um, well, I think this, you know, a couple of people have sort of mentioned this, this reorganizing the resources that we have and looking at things a little bit differently. And so uh, I've been starting to talk around this idea of scaling out instead of scaling up. Uh, and so how are we creating more resilient local economies? And, you know, we have an example of a zero waste grocery store in uh, British Columbia that has 200 local suppliers, all these like farms locally that are feeding the store. And a lot of people are like, what a nightmare. How do you manage all of that? Uh, but she has uh, created this backend system. It's not a grocery.ca created this backend system to manage all of these local suppliers. And so she had no disruptions during COVID around this. And we see, you know, with Amazon's purchase of Whole Foods, they come into the market using their traditional kind of like cut all costs as much as possible, look for the single suppliers. They've just erased uh, and canceled their local supplier uh, contracts in ac across Canada because there is not scaled up enough. That is like super unresilient. This is a, this is going to be a problem in the future. You're going to see empty shelves uh, as these supply chains uh, occur. So I, I'm hoping that we're going to start looking at these distribution, these innovative distribution mechanisms. Another one would be Skipper Auto. Our fish is caught in BC, sent to China to be processed, and then shipped back so it goes in the stores. People are now going, these are crazy making things that we've organized our economy around. We need to shift it. 
So I think the new distribution mechanisms that are focusing on scaling out uh, and doing things a little bit differently are getting a bunch of traction. Uh, and they're not as weird as they used to be five years ago. So I hope to see more and more of that. Thank you very much. What about you, Carolyn? Anything you would add that you're seeing that this is the beginning of the right uh, direction we should be taking? Well, I, I think this, this call to action is being felt by a wide range of people across political stripes. Uh, we all know how trust has been eroded and and it's really difficult for people to find consensus. But I, I mean, I think there is consensus on there's there's something that's really broken here. And I COVID laid that bare, and it's tragic that it needed to happen that way. But you know, the focus I'm seeing around the international tables. Uh, I'm part of a G7 working group uh, for the presidency in the UK this year, and you know, the focus on labor on recognition that inequality is not just a human problem, it's actually or a social problem, it's an economic problem. And, and so, um, you know, I think that call to action is being heard. And people are acting on it. I think that, I think that, um, you know, when I look at what the G7 is doing, the G7 leaders have have agreed on, um, you know, tax reforms, international tax reforms, which means global monopolies in the digital space will be paying more of their fair share. Uh, they're thinking about digital governance uh, in a way that they hadn't before. And also just reforming, uh, you know, the international multi WTO, international groups that that really aren't serving uh, the public interest in the way that they that they were in the past or that we hope they would. And so I think that combined with them, um, what I'm seeing is kind of a can-do attitude among uh, Canadian companies. Uh, you see them pivoting to from coats to personal protective equipment. Um, among many other businesses, small that needed to move online, uh, kind of a rise in community spirit. It's really an opportunity. And you know, when we came out of the global financial crisis, there was a call to action for financial reforms that created the impetus. I think this time. Uh, the call to action is all about people and how to fix the problems that have been just so uh, so well articulated by the other panelists and do it in a way that's collective, not just in Canada, but but at the global level. And I think it's a, it's a call to action that we need to answer. Yeah. Thank you. Nadia, anything you would add? No, you know, I, I, what, I said no, and now I'm going to say <laughs> something. Uh, <laughs> Um, you know, what I, I would just add and, and build on what others have said um, to, to just say that I think that what we have seen, which is a positive thing, is, you know, really a conversation now around the fact that, again, using these traditional institutions in radically new ways. So even, for example, when we think about public-private partnerships, in the past, public-private partnerships you know, the paradigm was really premised on a very narrow goal of facilitating business, right? It really was, how can we create these partnerships to drive forward um, um, business? And, and now we're starting to talk about, okay, how do we build public-private partnerships that are really and truly joint, cooperative, and interdependent contracts between the public sector and the private sector that are real that really have as its goal um, shoring up our economy and then ensuring that the that we get the distribution piece right as well. That's very different. And I think that, you know, as Carolyn said, across all kind of political stripes, we're really starting to have that conversation. And then secondly, um, I would say that, you know, there really is now more of an appetite and certainly the conversation around the G7 table, certainly the conversation at the World Trade Organization more now than ever, especially under the leadership of Dr. Ngozi, um, is really about, you know, a, a recognition that there might indeed be a role for government to play more than ever in nudging and shaping demand to help move ourselves forward to towards a more sustainable, a more inclusive, a greener economy. And I think that those two things are really positive signs. The fact that um, you know that we're hearing that conversation uh, around across the board and, and and around the globe. That's great, Sylvia. Um, what about you? Yeah, absolutely. So I I agree. Yes, 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 uh, with everybody <laughs> and. 
Uh, so Nadia finished with a sustainable and greener. I also want to add more inclusive uh, economy. So um, again, I, I am happy that we are seeing more and more organizations committing to bringing in more women into their supply chains, more Aboriginal businesses, more visible minorities, more gay and lesbian communities, more people with disabilities, creating those spaces and those opportunities for uh, the businesses. In addition to that, and that wouldn't be possible without the necessary mentorship of those suppliers. Some of those suppliers are just unable to come into the supply chains yet. But we've seen, uh, especially this year, uh, 2021, we've seen lots of organization to, uh, organizations from Government of Canada, RBC, BMO, and others to just come up with mentorship programs to come alongside of those business owners and to really help them understand the uh, uh, the uh, how to scale up the business, how to um, set up their business in order to be competitive, in order to be uh, compliant uh, with uh, the procurement expectations of large corporations. And this is what I would love to see more of um, throughout the pandemic, because we are not out yet, as well as post-pandemic. Um, so I really want to see more of those partnerships where corporations realize that uh, maybe the suppliers aren't ready yet, but we want to come alongside of them, help them come to the level, get to the level where they will be ready and able to compete and win those contracts and then have them and help them scale up, take more and larger opportunities. Instead of just saying there are no suppliers, uh, there are suppliers, they need opportunities, they might need help and support. And I, I just really hope that post pandemic, we will see more of that. We will see more partnerships with organizations like VB Canada, CAMSI, uh, CEO, who support um, businesses like women, Aboriginals, minorities, and really helping those businesses scale up because it will, again, have a ripple effect on our economy. One more thing I want to mention, something that we did at VB Canada this year uh, during pandemic, um, the past one and a half years. We actually developed a supplier diversity program supports. Uh, so we've seen a lot of new organizations coming and wanting to, uh, to diversify their supply chains, but they just don't know how. Uh, so we put together the tools and the resources to help them develop the programs, connect with other uh, corporations um, who are doing it to basically speed up the, uh, speed up the program implementation to get from uh, zero or 0.5% 0 spent with women-owned businesses to uh, 2%, 5%. And hopefully, eventually, we get to the spend level uh, that we are seeing in the U.S. Uh, they mandate, uh, U.S. government had a mandate of 10%. They are expanding their mandate to 20% by 2025. This is something I absolutely wish our government of Canada would do and commit to post-election. So, uh, there's uh, so many fantastic things happening. I, uh, I just don't think we have enough time to talk about them, but I really wanted to highlight that there are good things happening, great trends that we can really build on and learn from. Thank you very much. Um, Carolyn, I'm wondering if you could share with us your thoughts vis-a-vis. -vis. We said this is not an, an economic recovery, it's a people recovery. And when you look at the economy, what are the risks out there that um, we could say this is not a recovery that is inclusive, nor is it sustainable? Give us your perspective on that. Well, we heard earlier uh, from Vicky, Cassandra and Sylvia just how uneven the effects of the sharp recession we had yet last year were, was on uh, people. It's just unbelievable how how um, even if you look at wages today, uh, some workers have higher wages than they did in the past and, and others are still employed and have lower wages uh, than they did in the past. And, and uh, you know, I think when we, just as an example, when you look at women, um, maybe employment has increased, but if you look at labor force participation, it's if we've been set back a decade, it's unbelievable. And so as we're seeing the global economy and the Canadian economy uh, recover, especially in advanced economies, I think it has to be good news. That's, that's a nice foundation. But we can't just kind of say, okay, now we're done. Uh, there, there's a lot of people that still haven't recovered. And the longer that it lasts, the, 
the, the big uh, cost that I see is the longer that the effects they have uh, on people that have been touched by COVID are permanent. And so we'll find it harder to get it back into the, the labor force. We'll find it harder to get jobs. And so, and so I don't think we can lose sight of that. You know, and then on top of that, there are just, uh, you know, some of the risks that, that uh, we need to face that were even there before. I mean, clearly, uh, the transition to a lower carbon footprint is a challenge for Canada, given our carbon footprint, but also globally, and it creates its own financial and human risks. Uh, we've got, uh, we've got a, 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 you know, a long-term productivity growth problem where growth is really slow, and it's hard to fix things when, when you don't have the money to do it. You know, and I think even when we look closer, uh, we're in a situation where inflation is pretty high. It's, you know, central banks, uh, you believe, and I think they've got great analysis that it's, it's um, likely to be temporary. But those increased costs are things that families who, especially families with lower income, are facing every day when they're trying to fill up their tank or they're going to the grocery store. You see the supply chain disruptions um, that are happening now. Uh, some of them are in, in uh, semiconductors. You read about that. But it's also in the food supply chains. Uh, something as simple as packaging. Things we took for granted when we built those supply chains, thinking efficiency is the be-all and end-all. Well, it turns out it's it's not. Uh, resilience is is also important. And so I think that what that means is that it leads us, us vulnerable to uh, you know future uh, spikes in COVID or any kind of shock that could create a downturn because we're not starting from the strongest place. And so for me, what that means is got to answer that call to action that we've all been talking about because you know we need to promote long-term growth. And I think that in this case, the social aspect of it is perfectly aligned with the long-term aspect for growth. We're leaving money on the table, not financing you know businesses of, of you know, the groups that we've been talking about, whether it's women, black, you know, people of color, indigenous groups, it's money left on the table that, that we need to, we need to capitalize on. And I think that we need to recognize to the point that Nadia made that I think is fantastic is that the market forces are great, um, but sometimes they break down and they fail us. And that's when we need public and private partnerships to fix this. So thank you. Well, Nadia, you know, you're in the food business. Food has done pretty well uh, during the pandemic. How can it help um, looking at the point of view of your sector in terms of a sustainable and inclusive uh, recovery? Yeah, maybe I'll highlight two things here. And, you know, the, f the first may might be probably uh, is intuitive uh, to, some, to some folks listening. You know, the, the food sector actually represents a new economy sector. Um, if you think about it, you know, it already accounts, agriculture and agri-food already accounts for 1 billion jobs worldwide. Um, and, you know, most, most studies show that um, global food production is going to need to rise by 70%, 70 by 2050, if we're going to feed the world's population, right? Um, and so, you know, and in the, in the Canadian context, we are actually one of the few countries that are net exporters of agricultural products and, and the only G7 country that, that is a next net, net exporter. So, you know, we, we are poised um, in, in the Canadian context to really have agriculture, agri-food and the food sector um, be part of a robust recovery. We are recognized amongst the most trusted, competitive, reliable, safe, sustainable, high quality agri-food producers in the world. And we're also seen as an innovator, um, in, particularly, in, in particular when we talk about value added products. Um, so, you know, when, when you level set it, you know, the opportunity is, is there for, it, for, for the food sector to really contribute um, to, to a sustainable um, and a future economy. And, and if we take it to the next level, um, and, and I, I think that as we look to leverage this opportunity, we would also really take the time, and, and Carolyn you know, pointed to this as, as well and, and, and direct, directed us to it, um, we would take the time to really learn more about uh, the choke points uh, and the vulnerabilities in the food system. 
and, and then really identify what are the investments and the reforms that are needed to, again, further strengthen this idea of the resiliency of the sector to deal with, and I, you know, I'm beating the drum again, the future shocks that we know are going to come. Because for me, I, I really believe that a resilient sector, in particular when it comes to food that is so reliant on supply chains, um, will, will translate into a sustainable and inclusive sector. Um, and, you know, in that regard, I think that, that some of the concrete things that we, that we need to, to look at is, you know, um, and, you know, I'm a trade policy uh, uh, geek at heart. So I will always say, you know, how do we ensure that we keep domestic and international markets open, transparent and predictable, um, in particular for, for, for small business owners, but for all business owners, for all companies, you know, the predictability of the international markets and in, in particular for Canadian companies, again, we, we rely on exports. We are a trading nation, um, is, is, is vital. And, and, and again, how do we use the international trading system to promote the production of food in an environmentally sustainable way? Um, you know, put, put another way, how, how can trade really promote um, the, the price signals, the right price signals to encourage the production of food in an environmentally sustainable way? Um, and, and then the second thing that I would say, and it's a little bit, you know, I see it as kind of the, the flip side, the other side of a conversation around food security. Um, and that's the side linked to what we have been talking about, you know, the side linked to people. Um, we, we really can't divorce conversations around an inclusive uh, recovery from the day-to-day -day experiences of populations across Canada and around the world. Um, you know, when we talk about food, the, the fact in this country, in Canada, is that 4.3, 4.4 million Canadians uh, today are food insecure, uh, which means that they, they can't afford the food that they need. And so as, as, we, as we talk about how we're going to build our economy for the future, um, I really just believe that we, and, and the food sector included, you know, we can't leave out these conversations around distribution and access to the benefits across societies. And this is indeed true for food. And, and, and in the case of food, it's sadly not as simple a fix of just, you know, producing more or increasing charity. Um, but it really is uh, a conversation that needs to be had hand in hand with other sectors, the food sector with other sectors. And again, working together with government, um, who also has a role to play in, in, in the policy framework to ensure um, that we really are moving towards uh, an inclusive economy. Thank you for this. Uh, Caroline, I'm wondering whether, um, touching on something Nadia just spoke about, um, trade overall. Um, certainly when we look at growth, trade is, international trade will play a big role in this. You have a view from kind of the, the global stage. From that perspective, what is it that uh, we really need to be conscious about? Like this is not just for Canada. Canada has a lot of things to do, but worldwide, as companies are trying to get to sell their service and products elsewhere in the world, what are the things that we need to have top of mind. Well, I think that I think that uh, Nadia touched on on it earlier when we were talking about international governance. Uh, you know, globally, uh, this sort of post-war world where where globalization uh, occurred and it lifted a lot of people out of poverty. It really made a change, especially for for emerging markets, in a way that was particularly positive. But that, to me, that whole system is, is, is not serving us well. And that's what, that's the foundation for international trade. That's the world we're living in. And, and in my mind, uh, it needs uh, considerable reform and right down to the, the root and put the root of it. You know, it was built on this presumption that in the 20th century, everybody thought, okay, well, global economies are going to, are going to become market based. And, and because of that, we're not going to have the distortions that we could fear from, from say more socially managed uh, uh, economies. And so 
you know, we could see that that, that didn't happen. And not only did that not, did that not happen, um, you know, we've got the opposite in more recent decades with protectionism, uh, unfair subsidies, uh, people competing, uh, using labor that's got dubious and really undesirable labor standards. And so, and it's not even set up for the digital world. So there's, there's not a lot there to guide on services. And so for me, that's kind of like table stakes. Uh, to work towards that. And I know that, again, the G7 leaders in my work are, are focused on that. They can't do it alone, but certainly a, a common front from from um, countries that share the same democratic and social values could be a really important force to move forward for the good. You know, I'd have to say that, you know, for if we just bring it back to Canada, um, Canada is going to need to compete in this environment. And so, and so that idea of having competitive small and larger uh, companies that can play on the world stage and reverse what has been a real decline in market share, even in areas where we, we think we're winning, uh, like digital and financial services, it's going to be an imperative if we want to achieve those social objectives that, that we're, we're looking for. And so, and so um, I think there's a lot of work to do internationally, but there's a lot of work uh, to, do, to do at home. And uh, and uh, it touches on almost every one of the this policy areas that have been mentioned, from education to to capital raising uh, to access to markets. And uh, and you know I have to say that I'm really positive because we actually know what we need to do. It's just a question of doing it. That that's very mm-hmm. true. So we have. A little less than two minutes before we close off, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to go rapid fire. The one thing that we should remember, there's been a lot said, a lot of insight. You've made us certainly think about what needs to be done. I'll start with you, Vicky. What is the one thing that we cannot miss? If there's one thing we have to do right, what is that one thing? I think we need to look to where does innovation come from? And it's proven over and over that innovation comes from those who have been put to the margins, out on the margins look there. Uh, and we have a huge opportunity for process innovation. This is where a lo- everything's distribution. We have enough for everyone. We have to redistribute it differently. So look to the process innovations and get out of our like total focus on product innovation equals innovation. Perfect. Thank you. Cassandra. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to borrow where Sylvia and I live. I'm, the supply chain has to be looked at. We start at home. The Canadian government has started to, uh, start to address that from being inclusive inclusive and each of our companies in Canada have to look and be intentional about their inclusion for this diverse marketplace. If we start to build at home, then we can actually grow that as we move beyond the borders. Thank you. Sylvia. Absolutely. I'll have two uh, because I can't uh, decide. So number one, address the biases in supply chains. Uh, There's so many biases. There's so many things that people believe about women-owned businesses and other minorities that are not true. And uh, second, that goes hand in hand with that uh, measurement and tracking. I really would like to see more measurement around how much companies are spending with women-owned businesses, how much they are spending with uh, visible minorities and other uh, underrepresented groups, because without measurements, uh, we believe our stories that we are diverse and we are inclusive, but without tracking and measurements, you can't improve. You don't know where you are at. And um, it's it just not true what you believe. <laughs> so I want to see some numbers from the companies. Ladies, I thank you. This was a rich conversation. You told us what we need to do. Now we just have to go and do it. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much. And I would like to thank the Conference de Montréal as well as Global Affairs. Thank you very much. <laughs>